Hi everyone, Grzegorz Benen here. A texture atlas is a set of individual elements arranged and packed on a single texture sheet. From the material point of view, texture atlases are fully functional PPR materials, which contain a set of individual props stored in 2D form. With the scatter tools apps like Substance Designer or Sampler offer, these elements can be recognized as individual objects and scattered over already existing materials to add additional interests to them. There are many different techniques to create atlas textures. Probably the most common and the easiest one is the single image to PBR conversion technique because a single image contains very limited amount of data and especially when captured in uncontrolled environment it gets too many variables which can be easily misinterpreted. This approach is very useful for content we don't plan to watch from close distance and where the actual height accuracy isn't a key. With this technique we take an image of the prop or group of props, process it with the image to PBR app of our choice which interprets the image and translates it into a set of PBR textures. Next we manually crop the data and arrange its placement within an atlas texture space into the app. The results we get with this approach aren't very reliable, but as long as we deal with simple objects and the actual height accuracy isn't our top priority, this technique is totally fine. For more accurate PBR results we can use a photometric stereo technique. With this one we construct the height and the color information by observing the light behavior while illuminating the subject from different directions. Unfortunately, this technique can be processed only in fully controlled dark and lighting environment and is usually limited to around 15 by 15 centimeters capture space. To proceed with this technique, we have to mount the camera in fixed position to frame the subject and take a few photos from the same position while moving the light around, casting shadows from different directions. Next, we process these images with the dedicated software which analyzes shadow changes and estimates the surface color and normals information. This technique gives us quite reliable results and is relatively quick. Unfortunately, the shadow used as a source of high information has some limitations and the technique struggles with more complex and steeper shapes. Similar to previous technique, a PBR texture set we generate this way needs some manual tweaking and fixing and needs to be manually arranged within a texture atlas space. There is also another technique which in my opinion gives the best possible quality and high accuracy for any atlas texture sets and this is the one I want to present in this video. With this technique the source of PBR information comes from an actual 3D object so the reconstruction is based on pure 3D information. These 3D objects are limited to our own scans but can be also taken from any external digital libraries of 3D scanned data or these can be even 3D models modeled from scratch in any 3D app. The idea behind this technique is quite simple. To create an atlas texture from 3D props we need just two things. A 3D prop with color information and a low poly canvas plane we can use to arrange prop placement across the atlas texture. With the baker we project 3D information from the high poly geometry into 2D form using this flat low poly plane. Since we work in 3D we can freely arrange the props on the canvas plane, copy and rotate them to to simulate their different variations and bring more diversity to the atlas. Technically the more diversity the better and more authentic the scatter result will be. Just bear in mind that nothing stops us to use and mix different atlas textures together later. So I would say that the consistency and quality is more important to props diversity. The canvas object is just a simple one-sided plane with the simple one-to-one -one UV unwrapping which fills entire UV space. It can be created in any 3D software of our choice like Blender, 3D Max or even ZBrush. We can reuse this canvas in the future with any other new atlas texture sets we want to create. Regarding the prop as set, we can get one in many ways. We can model one using any 3D app by ourselves or download it from any scanning database we have access to or can scan one on our own. I would say the sky is the limit here. So let's jump into the actual case. 
There was a certain surface type I needed for my project, which I wanted to scan somewhere, but since I wasn't able to find anything close to it anywhere, I had to find a different way to get it done. It was an irregular, bumpy, plowed earth surface with some form of large-scale direction. Areas which potentially could be useful for scanning were already planted. The only bare earth surface I found was located on a construction site and it had nothing common with plowed surface I needed for my project. At some point I came up with an idea to scan a few small individual elements of the earth surface and assemble them together into exact shape and form I was looking for. I collected just two earth clamps, a larger and a smaller one. Next I used my photogrammetry setup for 3D prop scanning and took series of images to turn them both into 3D models with the photogrammetry app later. Since I already made a full video about this setup for those interested, I will put link into this video description. Basically, I put the large earth clamp on a turntable and captured it by taking 141 images of it. The earth surface isn't reflective, but I still use cross polarization setup to get clean background separation. After each full 360 revolution I rotated the clamp manually to capture its different side. 141 images were totally enough for this scan. Auto masking feature MetaShape offers saved me a lot of time, but I had to manually adjust masks to cut the dirt captured at the turntable base. A masking isn't a must, as recent photogrammetry software have function to recognize background points and skip them, but personally I have noticed that results are better if I mask unwanted elements out, which is a no-brainer as auto-masking is very easy and straightforward in any photogrammetry app, especially when scanning in void. Since the second earth clamp was smaller, to avoid issues with the dirt beneath the prop on a turntable, I decided to use a different holder. Same as before, I set the turntable to capture 36 images per full 360 revolution, which gives 10 degree angle steps between each image. Because this earth clamp seemed to be a bit more complex to the previous one, mostly due to some vegetation elements, I decided to add one more 360 revolution, and in result I took 174 images to capture it. Same as before, to make sure it's covered from all directions, I manually rotated prop on different sides after each 360 pass. As you can see I messed up a bit with rotation rings as some overlap too much within the same axis, but it doesn't matter really and the reconstruction result still was good enough to what I needed. Thanks to the holder choice the masking was fully automatic and I didn't need to fix a single thing. After 3D reconstruction I generated an albedo texture for each earth clamp and I exported meshes as FBX file and textures as 8K TIFFs. Now we are ready to create an atlas texture of earth clamps. Let's open Marmoset Toolbag 4 and drag our low poly canvas into the scene. Next let's do the same with our two scans. The scale might be off, but it doesn't really matter. Let's select the first one. Bear in mind that the pivot point of scanned objects might be totally off and we can center it around the object by hitting the center pivot button on the top bar. Now let's move it up and scale it up a bit. And let's do the same with the second mesh knowing that it should be about two thirds of the large one size. Now we need to create and apply materials to both. First let's create a material for the large one, drag and drop it to the mesh to apply it. Let's apply the albedo texture we generated in Metashape to carry albedo. In this case, the earth material is quite simple. It is rough, so let's bring roughness of this material to 1, and I would say that this material is really done. The second mesh isn't as simple as it has some stones which should be a bit more shiny, so let's create another new material. Also bring it roughness to 1 to get rid of any surface shyness and apply it to the mesh. Since I want to apply a different roughness level to the stones, let's switch to the texture mode. Switch to layers in material tab and hit the add texture project button to create new texture project. Now let's modify the texture project setting a bit. Since we have just an albedo map, let's get rid of all input maps and bring the albedo one. 
we want to modify only the albedo and the roughness channels, so let's remove all project maps we don't want to modify. Now we can switch between them in the layers section on materials tab. We don't need any outputs, so let's remove them all from outputs maps tab to keep it clean. As you can see, an albedo looks very bright. It's caused by the incorrect color space setting. Our albedo was generated in sRGB, not linear space, so let's switch it back to the sRGB then. And we are ready now to drag the small earth clamp material to the texture project so we can modify it. Let's switch the render quality so we can see the material applied. As you can see, it doesn't look rough anymore, so let's modify it. The roughness slider doesn't work in here as it's overwritten by the texture project. So let's go back to layers, switch to roughness channel and apply a fill layer. Now we have got an access to the layer settings. Since we don't want to modify the albedo, let's switch it off and increase the roughness to 1 for the roughness channel. As I mentioned, I wanted these pebbles to be slightly more shiny when compared to the rough dirt surface. To paint over the existing roughness level we just set, let's bring the paint layer. Let's turn the albedo for this paint layer off and keep just roughness active. Now we can paint the roughness with the power set by the roughness slider. The preview is visible on this preview sphere. As you can see now the stone is way more shinier. Of course it's too much, so let's increase the roughness level and paint it properly. Let's paint other stones the same way. Of course roughness level for these stones isn't as important as they would be probably fine even if I would keep them rough. But since this workflow can be very useful for other types of props, I wanted to show you the easy way it can be done. Anyway, it's done. Now we are ready to create an atlas texture. First, let's bring the baker by hitting new bake project button. The atlas texture is going to be baked into the flat plane. It means that our canvas plane needs to be dragged to the low poly section of the baker. Because both earth clamps are going to be used as a high poly source we are going to bake from, we need to drag them into the high poly section of the baker. By default, high poly models are invisible. We can make them visible by hitting an eye next to the high poly layer or by going into bake project layer level and hitting the H button. The H stands for high poly, while the L for the low poly. Anyway, now we need to get the most of our high poly models and arrange them across the low poly plane. To do this we need to copy them, rotate and position under different angles so they look unique when seen from the top. The only condition is that there has to be a gap between them, as the scattering software uses this gap to distinguish individual props from each other and treat them as separate objects. Since each prop has 6 sides, it gives us 6 unique views. With 2 props then we should be safe to create at least 12 individual atlas props without worrying about about similarity between them. If we add some angling, I believe that we can create even 16 unique looking earth clamps. When done, we need to make sure that props are evenly distributed with clean gaps between each and we can move to the next, the baking stage. First, we need to set up the baker. Let's set the output path, the file name and the file format. Let's set the output channel to 16 bits. We don't want any padding as we need sharp and easy to interpret edges. Let's set the resolution to 4K. Next, let's set all PBR textures we want to bake down. We definitely need normal map, height, an ambient occlusion, albedo, roughness and the opacity map. Next, we need to define the projection range. We can do this by selecting a low poly layer and setting max offset for the cage which covers all our props. Next, let's copy this value and switch back to the bake project. In the height map settings, let's paste the cage distance value we just copied into the outer distance and with the minus into the inner distance. Depending on the setting we want to go with, we can also flip the Y in normal settings. 
Next we can bake the entire texture set down. As you can see it didn't work as intended as the baker also projected the data from the beneath the canvas surface. In result we got some elements out of the canvas. Also the elements itself are a bit too close to each other. Let's fix this by rescaling all props slightly down and rearrange their placement a bit. And this time let's move them above the plane so we can see if any intersects with another. Now we have to readjust the cage distance so we are sure that all earth clamps are within the baker's projection range. And update the height distance for the height map. Now we can bake our atlas again. And here is the result which looks definitely way better this time. Now we have nice and clean albedo, opacity, ambient occlusion, normal and the roughness map. As intended, the roughness is slightly darker in areas where we painted small rocks to be shinier. Anyway, at this point we can simply use these atlas maps to scatter them across any surface we want with the scatter tool Substance Designer offers. But we can also encapsulate them into an SBAR archive form, similar to the one we can find for example on Substance Source. An SBAR file format allows us to expose additional control over the atlas parameters within a single file, but also to use it with the Substance Sampler if needed. So to automate the process and make my life easier, I pre-made an Atlas template which I can reuse with every new Atlas texture set I create. I split it into a few key sections. The first one is the section where I bring baked maps. To apply them, I drag and drop bake texture set and plug each texture into proper channel. Of course, textures which expect to get grayscale type of data need to be switched to grayscale mode. If the color mode isn't correct, it is presented with the dotted line. The next section is responsible for splatter options, which I expose to the user with multi-switch nodes. These are four options user is going to get as a choice. The first one I called as default is the initial layout from the texture set. The second one is called grid and it's a layout driven by the atlas splatter node. Next we have a single element which outputs individual elements only. And the last one is a splatter one which outputs randomly scattered layout. Of course I exposed most key parameters for each of them and make them visible on interface face depending on the mode picked by a user. I did it through visible if function. So in practice the user gets set of scatter related options in splatter mode which disappear if the mode is changed to a different one where these options don't apply. For the single element I need to manually input the amount of individual elements, which in this case is 14. This way we set the proper range for a slider to allow user for switching between all individual elements. The next section is responsible for technical parameters for each channel. I set it to expose things like hue, saturation, brightness or normal intensity, normal mode and these are basically all things I exposed there. The last section is the output section. I use switch nodes to expose the visibility of output nodes. So basically when the switch returns true, the corresponding to it output is visible. When the value is false, the output disappears. Let's export this one very quick so we can preview this behavior. And here it is. This is an SBAR Atlas node where we can control all these parameters. And these are channel outputs I mentioned. By hitting the output status button, we turn them off from the node. This way user can pick output channel types to work with. But let's go back since before the Atlas texture is exported, we should set its ID, thumbnail, label or tag any keywords which would help us to identify it when the user searches for it in a future material library. And at this stage the Atlas is done and can be officially exported. And here it is, fully functional Atlas texture embedded into an SBAR file. We 
which can be used to scatter Atlas elements across already existing materials or even to generate a brand new one. Of course, the Atlas is fully functional in both forms. We can bring it as both the SBAR archive file with full control over its values, but we can bring it also as a texture set and apply any control we might need later. Anyway, let's open a new substance graph and bring our Atlas texture. We can bring it as a single SBAR file or a set of individual PBR textures where each represents and separate PBR channel. It's really up to us. Next, let's bring Atlas Scatter node. This is the node where entire scatter magic happens. It has two main inputs, the Atlas one and the background, and a few supportive inputs through which we can control overall props distribution. We can stack Atlas Scatter nodes together and use the result from the previous one as a background of the next one. And this is basically how I made this material. I stacked three different consecutive layers of material and blended them together. We can bring all PBR inputs from the Atlas with one go if we used a template, or we can plug them one by one using individual maps. First, we need to switch maps, which should be in a grayscale mode. When plugged, the result is the same, unless, for example, we want to make our albedo slightly brighter or the normal map more or less intense. The template I made saves some work, especially when we work with many atlases at the same time, but the rules are the same. So let's get rid of the individual texture set and plug the SBAR atlas we made instead. Now we need to generate a solid flat base. Since I know that the earth clumps are roughly around 10 cm large and that I want to recreate 180 by 180 cm wide area, I should set the amount of props for both axes around 20 by 20 and scale them up a bit to fill the empty space. Let's plug it into the output so we can preview the result in 3D view. The Atlas Scatter node doesn't output the ambient occlusion, so let's generate one from the height map for material preview. I believe we have quite decent result already. But let's play with the actual shape. As I said, I wanted to create a terrain material which has a kind of messy plowed form. To do this, we need to tell the scatter tool how do we want the Atlas elements to be distributed. And we can do it by creating a flow map and plug it into the scatter tool direction inputs. So let's bring the gradient map. This one will mark plowed rows. Next, let's break straight lines a bit with the directional warp and perlin noise, so it feels more organic and natural. Let's do this on large and medium level. I believe it should do the job. So let's try it and bring another Atlas scatter node. Let's plug the Atlas texture into its Atlas input and play a bit more with the scattering options. The idea is that we want our map to drive parameters like scale and our elements distribution. The brighter the mask is, the larger elements should be. Also, we want the earth clumps to be scattered more in brighter mask areas so they look like the earth piles up. With the mask random slider, I just removed all clumps from the dark areas. Now let's set the scale the way it will follow the map to. Now we have larger clumps in the brighter mask area and smaller the darker the mask goes. Now let's multiply the amount of air clamps so they pile up to look more natural and scale them up. Let's randomize their position a bit. Of course, we can affect their distribution also by modifying the mask which drives them. Anyway, when ready, we can stack two Atlas scatter nodes together and preview the result. Let's use the first one as a background for the second one, and let's connect the outputs of the second one with the material outputs. 
because I want the earth clamps to be smaller the lower they are, let's plug our distribution map to the height scale and set the height scale slider to its maximum to get full mask response. To avoid these harsh stretched edges, we have to smooth the height map a bit. So let's bring the Blur HQ grayscale node and blur the height the way we don't get the stretching. It doesn't look bad. Anyway, at this point it's the game of trial and errors and this is not the video about the Substance Designer, so let's jump to the end result. This is the final plot earth material which I'm happy with. It works quite well when tiled and has plot direction I wanted. To make it I used three atlas scattered nodes, one for the base, second for the main rows and the third one to add some medium level randomness. Each takes a previous one as a background. Their distribution is driven by mask generated from warp and blurred gradient linear node. To get some distinction between peaks and lower areas I modified the color a bit. I blended the final generated albedo with the gradient map, brighter for peaks and darker for dips. I also desaturated peaks a bit using initial mask to get a bit more dry feeling for them, so it contrasts with the more muddy and wet bottom parts. I emphasized wetness approach with the roughness where I also utilized the mask used to drive scatter distribution. I did the same for the ambient occlusion and that's it. This is the entire graph I made. We can simplify it a bit visually, but I hope that overall concept is clear enough and easy to follow. To summarize, this is not the best technique ever, but one of many ways to bring photorealistic quality into our materials. We can use atlas maps to scatter individual elements very cheaply and quick, but we can also scatter them using physics-based simulations or even scatter full original 3D props manually in 3D apps and bake them from there. As you see, atlas textures are pretty easy to handle and don't engage a lot of processing power and time. Unfortunately, atlas scatter tools Substance Designer or Sampler offer are still quite simple and need some development to be done. They don't have any collision detection and are based on simple offset and rotation. Would be great if at some point the scatter tool gets some AI help or physics-based simulation mechanism so the actual scatter doesn't feel so much off and random. Hopefully masks gives us some basic control over scattered elements on large level, but the tool still lacks control on medium and small level like self-detection for individual elements or any height base flow simulation. This is why it is so hard to get any high quality photorealistic looking results this way. I would say that if we can fully scan the original material somewhere, the scan is going to be way better to any atlas scatter based material we can get with this approach. But if we can't, this is definitely an option to consider. Also, it's still a decent option to add some interest and variety to already existing materials. Anyway, I really hope someone has found this video useful and if you want me to create and share even more content like this one, please leave the thumbs up, drop a comment and subscribe to my channel. Big thanks to all of you who did this already as it really motivates to move forward. Hopefully you see you with the next one. Take care and stay safe. Bye!